Hi, everyone. Okay, let me quickly switch that around. So, um, it, I'm just going to dive right in. If you have any questions during my talk, high performance images, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. I'm going to reply and we can have debates months after this talk if you try any of the tools I'm going to talk about today. So, um, how, no, do, how do I get started? I think I'm going to tell you about how I got started into that whole business. Um, oh, and the clicker isn't working. Damn, why not? Clicker. Ah, here we go. So, um, before Akamai, I had a different life. And uh, the different life was doing websites. And um, while I was creating websites, I got into web performance bit by bit. And in 2012, I had a customer that wanted to launch a site. And it was the first customer who actively, without me evangelizing for it, came to me and said, we want a performance budget for that site. And I was like, oh my god, that's amazing. Yes, <laughs> finally, after years of talking about it, a customer who actively wants that. That's so cool. I was so happy to have them. So when I got their large zip files with all the data that you need to create the website, what was in there, of course? PSD files with 90 megabytes of size. Obviously, right? So I thought I can't possibly use these images in that kind of detail and resolution that they're shipping them, or that they're sending them to me. I have, for the web performance, I have to optimize these images, compress them so that they load faster. That was my basic idea. So I compressed them, and they weren't small enough, so I compressed them some more. They got some visual artifacts, but I was happy with the file size, and I thought, I'm not going to tell the customer, because that customer was obviously going to make trouble if I told them, look, there's artifacts in the images now, so I'm just not going to tell them and see if they're convinced by the web performance rather than the visual experience. That didn't work. So I showed them the initial version, and they were like, the first thing they did was like, there's compression artifacts in that image. And I was like, yeah, there's compression artifacts in that image. Damn. Going back to the drawing board here. So how do I get rid of the compression artifacts? And that was the proverbial Alice going down the rabbit hole. Um, three years later, I'm standing on that stage and talking about it. So the, tr the problem I, have, I was facing back in that time is actually the problem of hero images. Hero images are so common nowadays in uh, web design that they have had their, their own name uh, phrased. And actually, Steve Souders, Peter Renz already mentioned, has also coined a term for them now, the hero image delay. Because hero images are the biggest problem when we load images because they're so huge. And because they're the first visual thing that people see and they want to feel positive about engaging with the site. And if a hero image has compression artifacts, then people think, well, that's a bad website. That's bad for the brand awareness. So we don't want compression artifacts on hero images. That's a problem we have to solve and loading, f loading images faster. So the problem can be expressed in data. Um, this, uh, these are graphs from the HTTP archive by Steve. Um, and this shows how much image data there is in websites right now. Uh, this is from October, yeah, the, the beginning of October run. Um, because the end of October one was broken for me for some reason. But the beginning of October one shows the trend that has been there for like two years now. Images make up two-thirds of all the binary data, all the, so, or all the data that we ship for websites. So a huge chunk. In terms of HTTP requests, it boils down to 20 to 60 HTTP requests on average for images alone. That's huge. And images have a very, very high correlation to page load time. That means when the page has actually finished downloading completely so that all the little spinners stop. Of course, that doesn't mean that the website is unusable until that point, right? There's a big difference between speed index and perceived speed index, the usability of a site, and the page load event. They're, they are completely separate. So don't think that images are the one thing that are making every website slow, because there are websites that render very fast without having downloaded all the images. But for the page load event, they have the highest correlation. So it's kind of important to fix that, because they are that, that big of a binary chunk. Um, if I want to find out which data, which type of image I should fix first, I should probably tackle the biggest chunk first, right? So I have the huge, the, the huge win at the beginning. I mean, I don't, I don't want to start with, with SVG optimization. That's minute. I want to start with optimizing JPEGs. So today we're going to look at JPEGs primarily. Even the Q&A, by the way, you have questions about any other image format, really any other. I doubt that there's any other image format that I don't know by now. Hit it, but I'm going to talk about JPEGs during this talk. So for JPEGs alone, we have like 20 to 40 HTTP requests. It's still massive. That's weird. I'm not going to dance to that. Um, 
And in, for JPEG transfer size alone, that's like 400K for the average Alexa top 2,000 websites. That's massive. And the problem is users hate to wait. So we really have to fix this JPEG issue. We really, really have to do that. Also, because now we're facing, I mean, this photo is famous, we're facing the problem with that mobile is out there and mobile is, is the de facto standard. Working for Akamai, I can tell you that um, we are now seeing more mobile than traditional traffic sources and mobile is the de facto new standard. We can't say landline and then there's mobile. No, the web is now mobile and the rest is just dying away slowly while carrying our internet with us. So these big binary chunks are a big problem because they have to go over that, over that wireless connection. Also, with responsive images, we now have to ship different versions of an image and we need to optimize all of them for instant delivery. So, curious monkeys that we are, what can we do for JPEGs? Um, the thing is, we have to work with JPEGs because JPEGs, um, JPEGs do something very, very nice. They do full color. Um, that's what any other image format that was out there in the past didn't really do. And they transport images almost like we see them with the human eye. So that's really, really good. And they trigger emotions in us. So when we see such a full color photo on a JPEG, the, that triggers so many different areas in our, in our brains that we engage with websites on a completely different level as if we only were viewing a text-based site. So be it buy that product or donate this money, this amount of money, images get us to do these things. Text-based alone doesn't cut it anymore. People need to be emotionally engaged to the content that they see in order for action to be taken. So emotions are super, super important to get your visitors to do the stuff that you want on websites. Engagement. The images are super, super important for engagement. So first of all, we could look at workarounds. How can we ship images with, uh, with proper resolution and stuff uh, without causing huge delays for our, for our customers? How can we do that? So first of all, you could async everything. That's a pretty good approach. By the way, lots of websites that load very, load very fast at the top of the screen, they do asynchronous loading because they're still shipping 60 JPEGs, but they're not loading them all at the beginning. So one thing you could think about is, do I really need to ship 60, webs, uh, 60, 60 JPEGs over a mobile connection to my customer to make them convert? And the answer is in 19.9%, .9 no, you don't. You need to ship your first or second image and the rest can be, that is below the fold can be loaded asynchronously because that helps. Also, your, custom, your, your clients will like you because you're not wasting their data bandwidth. I'm, in, I'm roaming right now with my cell phone. I have 150 whooping megabytes available for all the time I'm staying here. That's not a lot considering that a website now weighs in at almost three megabytes. So I really can't do a lot of browsing. So if you managed to only show me two images to get the information across instead of 60, well done, I'm gonna love that website. So yeah, async loading, check it out. Also a thing that I really, really like that uh, Guy Pojami, former CTO of Akamai invented, is called low quality image placeholders. Another thing that works fantastic on mobile. And that is you wanna give people the impression that something has already loaded, but you, are have, you still have the problem that you might be able, you might need to ship dozens of kilobytes for that image to show. So what Guy Pojami invented is a low quality image placeholder that already shows a colorful and also shapeful preview of the image that is only a couple of hundred bytes big. And then when the, high, when the high resolution image is loaded, the image gets swapped out. There are JavaScript libraries that can do that right now. Um, they are free and available in, uh, on GitHub, so that's really easy. There's a picture fill, for example, um, by Scott Yell, I think has a, has a lazy loader. Um, Alexander Farkas's Lazy Sizes does that too, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, so they're really, really cool. Um, Gaipo wrote a blog post about it when he introduced it in 2013. Facebook has picked this up now and um, they, have, uh, wrote a really, they wrote a really nice blog post about it, how to do it in 200 bytes. So that's really cool. It's very nice. Oh yeah, by the way, everybody taking photos. The slide deck is already on speaker deck. So if you want to get all the links, just go to where.tobias.is. Um, that's my website and I'm, uh, there's a link to the speaker deck and you can find exactly the slide deck right now and get all the links. So yeah. LCAP, low quality image placeholders, another nice technique to work around the fact that we have to ship big binary blobs of images. Show a small placeholder until the big image has loaded, swap them out. Gives the user a nice visual impression 
and they can already start reading the content, maybe even get a feeling for the colors of the website or the image works. It, you don't have to show the low quality image placeholder for seconds. You can show it for a couple of hundred milliseconds and then swap it out. Still gives the users a better impression than waiting for an image to download. But these are all workarounds. So what I actually want to talk about today are the proper tools to do it right. So workarounds are neat, but we need to fix the actual problem. So let's talk about tools. What tools are available for JPEG? Well, the JPEG encoder. The JPEG encoder is as old as it gets. Um, the JPEG standard is from 1992, and when I first got into image optimization three years ago, I was like, that can't possibly be good anymore, right? Because it's not new. If it's not, that's the Western capitalists uh, thinking. If it's not new, it can't be good. So yeah, I thought stuff from 1992 can't possibly be good. But so I so I dug some more. But actually, it turns out JPEG is pretty cool. JPEG in 1992 is has been engineered very very well. So um, what you see in the background here are Internet Explorer 2 and is it Netscape Navigator? Yeah, the first browsers to support JPEG in 1995. The reason why that came to be is when Mark Andreessen um, uh, launched, what was it, Mosaic? Uh, he it only supported GIF images with 256 colors, but people wanted to view, to view full uh, color images, so we needed some new standard to ship full color over the web. And the JPEG standard had been fully standardized, and super important, it was open source. So you could just use it. It wasn't a proprietary image format. You could implement it, and so people did to solve that problem that people want to view full color images. So, bless you. Um, JPEGs are the, uh, so with, with libjpeg, the, which is the standard JPEG library, we can optimize images already. Um, shall I show you that? I'm, I'm gonna show you that in a second. Um, so libjpeg is under the hood for most image optimization tools right now. If you use the GIMP or photo, or actually Photoshop is a bad idea, GIMP, <laughs> um, this, is th this is something that uses libjpeg under the hood to optimize JPEGs. I was about to say Photoshop, but that's not true anymore. Photoshop has switched in, photo in CS2 or something to a proprietary library they're using. They're not using libjpeg anymore. They basically reverse engineered the whole thing. Um, but libjpeg is under the hood of most of the common things that render JPEG, because it's the open source library maintained for that. And they can, it can do the image optimization with quality loss and everything. It's kind of neat. Um, but as I said, uh, I, th I had the feeling it was, it was old, so it must be bad at the beginning. And the funny thing is, so did other companies. So in 2010, other companies thought, JPEG is from 1992 and we have that image problem. We need to solve that by obviously creating something new because new is better. Enter WebP. Um, that's uh, Google's attempt to solve the image optimization problem. Uh, WebP was created to fix it all in one go. Um, we have right now, we have like JPEG and PNG8 and PNG24 and GIF, yeah, uh, out on the web, that's the most predominant formats, and now SVG, of course. Um, and WebP tried to solve that all. It tried to do full color, eight color, uh, eight bit color. It tried to do animations and everything under one under one hood. And when WebP was launched, they claimed, well, it's like almost 30% smaller in all the compression uh, tests we ran. So everybody was super excited, and Google has a good marketing team, so everybody heard about WebP and well, got excited. The problem with WebP, is the follower? Oh, yeah. Let, I'm not sure if that's going to work, though. Let's see, because I don't have. In, do I have internet connection? Let's see. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, the can I use data as buffered? Sorry about that. I don't have uplink right now, but uh, this is still true. So the problem with WebP is this: nobody implemented WebP but Google. So WebP was available on Chrome, and that's about it. So that's a huge problem, because if browsers don't support an image format, people won't see the image. Actually, Facebook, again, Facebook, they switched to WebP for a while. They thought, well, the big wins from WebP are going to make our customers happy. So they switched to WebP, then found out customers hate downloading images and finding out that they can't open them uh, with other tools than Chrome. And so uh, they, did, they switched back from WebP. Also, people hated something about WebP that um, we might see today, let's see. And that is uh, the uncanny valley effect. Who knows what the uncanny valley effect is? Okay, I'm gonna explain it then. It's that when you view a human face, um, let's, make, let's say that's computer generated, it's, it's, it sometimes look like it's almost natural, but something's off. Look at modern 3D games right now. You look at these faces, they move, they talk, they have their lip movements, and you're like, 
that's kind of neat, but it's also something is off with that face. And that gut feeling that every human has as an identifier if the human face in front of them is real or not real, that is uh, the uncanny valley effect when you, when you feel that it's not real. And Weppy, when it compresses skin color, gives, some, gives skin sometimes some sort of plasticky look, as if somebody was, was wearing lots and lots of makeup to, to make the skin shine. So people had the feeling that when they viewed family photos in Weppy on Facebook, that people were having this uncanny valley effect. Faces were shiny and looked unreal. So people were like, this compression looks really wrong. Facebook, what are you doing? And then Facebook said, yeah, we switched to Weppy under the hood. And then they switched, ba switched back to JPEG because people didn't like it. So before I keep talking like this, let's look at this for a while. Um, but to, oh, sorry, wrong tool. Go away. Ch -ch -ch. Okay. So um, how do I do this? While the keynotes were running, I went up and took a photo because I wanted to show you all I'm doing, I'm talking about today live. This is uh, the large A1 conference room from like 45 minutes ago. This is the original photo I downloaded from the iPhone. Of course, the iPhone already takes a JPEG photo, which means it's compressed. So if I wanted to find out um, the quality of the JPEG, it's 96 because that's the default setting for the iPhone right now. Um, since it's unlikely that I want to upload 1.8 megabytes of image data to the web raw, I already created something that I'm going to call source JPEG. Um, that is a uh, recompressed version of that same image. This one is 7068 pixels wide and is created by the GIMP in quality 85 for with a save for web option. This is the base image for our tests now. The reason being, I wanted to create something that's runnable while I talk, and uh, I wanted to create something that's real. So if I'm, if, yeah, if I'm going to upload an image to the internet, it's very likely that somebody uses some sort of editing software before uploading the, the image. So I kind of mimic that process. So our source image here is 83 kilobytes big and 76, uh, 768 pixels wide. Um, now, with, uh, with, with the libjpg in GIMP, we get 83 kilobytes, right? So let's see how well Weppy does. Weppy is supposed to be doing really, really well. If you install Weppy, you get um, C Weppy on the command line to run it. We said the quality was 85, so I'm going to go with the quality of 85 for Weppy. The thing here that, is, uh, that you have to remember is that quality metric is completely void. So it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't transport. So you can't go quality 85 in WebP uh, equals quality 85 in JPEG. That's not the same thing. Even be in between a different JPEG encoders, that quality setting is not, defined, not standardized in the JPEG standard. So you can't transport that number. But for argument's sake, I'm using 85 for WebP here too. And let's see how small it gets, that image. So it's going to be really, really fast. Um, yes. Yes because of the arguments I just said, because I want to show the gains between a normally created file and WebP and other stuff, other stuff to come. So let's see how well we're doing. So, oh yeah, ignore the Peter. Um, we have the WebP format here now, and that's on 65 kilobytes. From 83 kilobytes, that's pretty, pretty good. And the problem I've been describing is this. If I want to open WebP now, Open with, the only tools that I can open it with is Affinity Photo because I just bought it and it has a WebP plugin built in, and Google Chrome. So that's the problem. I can't use Preview, I can't use any of the usual tools I would use for image manipulation because WebP is a format that is not supported, other outside of Chrome. It's a problem for normal users using images in a normal way, not editors. So that's why WebP isn't, isn't, so, isn't so popular. Um, but as we have seen, WebP has a huge file size gain. So that's why we people still try to implement WebP. And what I'm going to try to show you today is that it's possible to do that with JPEG too, because JPEG is supported in all the browsers. Um, the thing is, when Google started with a business with WebP, other companies jumped in too. Um, um, Google and Microsoft were battling for standardization of several stuff um, for a couple of years, since 2010 to 2013. 
uh, the most remarkable being HTTP2. So Sp uh, Google launched Speedy, and Speedy went to be HTTP2. Microsoft standard is not even remembered. I don't even remem remember the acronym anymore. But the same thing happened for WebP and JPEG. Microsoft thought, Google is going to launch a new image format. We have to do something about that. We have to create our own standard because, you know, we want that predominance there. So they just had bought a company that was creating a JPEG fork that was able to handle HDR images. And they, re they released that as JPEG XR to be a different pro proposal for a new image standard. Um, the thing with JPEG XR is they botched the open source licensing at the beginning, so people didn't even implement it. So JPEG XR was dead in the water for a while, while everybody talked about how great WebP might be in 2010 to 2012. And then when JPEG XR finally was under, available under GPL, nobody cared anymore. So that's the problem with JPEG XR. It's out there. It's supported by exactly one browser or one rendering engine. Um, but yeah, it's not really doing that well. Let's see here. Yes, so that's about the, that's the support for JPEG XR. Let me put that on the top of the screen for you. So that's IE from 9 onwards and the new Edge browser. That's it. So everything Microsoft had control over supports JPEG XR, nothing else. And there's also, again, like with WebP, no intent to implement by any other browser and uh, render uh, creator. So neither WebP nor JPEG XR will make it into any other rendering engine than the ones controlled by the people who proposed the format. That's a problem. So that whole debate about WebP and JPEG XR and stuff really always reminds me of that XKCD comic that we, you know, uh, we need to fix the problem with too many standards being out there because, you know, we need to find the one solution that fits it all. And a couple of months later, bam, we have plus one standard, but the problem isn't really solved. I really had to laugh hard when I read Leah Veru's uh, CSS Secrets, by the way, because she had a very good quote in there from the W3C. Um, that are kind of true, that reminds me of that whole debate, because these standards for, new, for images, they weren't formed to benefit the user. They were, they were created to benefit that one specific company who had a lot of weight. That, that's the problem. The end user wasn't in the focus. And that's a kind of what, these, what this quote really expresses very well. The end user gets, you know, gets botched because, yeah, other interests. Enter Mozilla. But Mozilla, being known to be nice, they did something really awesome in 2012-13. Um, they said, pardon my French, fuck all these standards. Um, we're going we're gonna to show that j the actual JPEG that we have been working with since 1995 actually can do what we want, what we need it to do right now in modern web design. And they um, created a study to show that, the, that a new encoder for JPEG that is smarter than the older encoders we had available was able to compress JPEG just as efficiently. The first study was launched in November 2013 and then in, uh, again in 2014, in the December 2014, I think. And then they open sourced the tool that they uh, created to do this study and it was called Mods JPEG. Love Mods JPEG. By the way, the image in the background is uh, in the San Francisco office. I love this. I have to get a copy of that. That's Red Godzilla finding Google Chrome UFOs. I find this so cool. I need to have this in my living room somewhere. Awesome picture. Um, so Mods JPEG was, uh, yeah, was open sourced and they showed that it was really, really awesome and that it could do very nice things, that it was smarter and better than LibJPEG ever was. So and uh, because it's open source, we can show what it does right now. So let's see, I've, um, yeah, if you install Mods JPEG, by the way, because it's supposed to be, to, supposed to be better than libjpeg, you get the, again, like with libjpeg, you could see JPEG for compressed JPEG on the command line. Don't get confused by me using mods JPEG on the command line. This is just a symlink. I always have to mention it. So I just symlinked cjpeg from mods from mods, from mods JPEG to be available under the mods JPEG command. Again, I'm using quality of 85. Oh yeah, by the way, the source image was progressive and uh, um, baseline optimized. No, and no EXIF data. I always forget to mention that. So no EXIF data and progressive rendering for the JPEG. And we're going to use the same parameters for mods JPEG for comparability. That was really, really fast. Mods JPEG is cool. Oh, typo. So, we had a source image of 83 kilobytes. And now, because I've been talking about Mods JPEG and how awesome it is, we have a great file size saving of 3 kilobytes. That sucks. What I've been talking about for the last five minutes, right? I mean, if I say Mods JPEG is that great, why the hell is that not working? 
Anybody know? No? Anybody listened to this talk before? <laughs> um, so the reason being that Mods JPEG is super conservative in its default settings. It, like my customer, clearly wants not to create compression artifacts. That's its main intention. It wants to compress images as optimally as possible, but it doesn't want to compress, uh, con con uh, create artifacts on the process. So if you use Mods JPEG without any fine-tuning, it is super, super conservative. That doesn't mean, however, that it doesn't create superior results if you fine-tune it. And for fine-tuning, I propose the following. We need to find out uh, how much difference there is between an input image and the output image to make sure that we give the best uh, parameters for compression to an image. Um, and to do that, we have to find a, uh, an algorithm that identifies these, Im these differences between an input and an output image. The thing is, the human visual system is kind of tricky about, you know, we see more red than we see blue, we see contrasts better than uh, differences in color, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's kind of difficult to model that into an algorithm, but, but people have tried for 30 years. So we had peak signal to noise ratio to identify this in the past, and it found out, well, peak to signal to noise ratio is not that good. So in the last couple of years, I think like for the last 10 years, people have started working on something that's called the similarity index. And the similarity index has gotten, like in open source, a lot of forks to get closer to the human visual system. There is um, CY uh, SSM by now for uh, complex wavelength analysis and stuff. So there's lots of good forks that try to get as closely as possible to, uh, to, to create an algorithm that can identify differences like the human eye would. And uh, the thing, the tool I've been using is called DSIM by Cornel Lezinski, who's using Image Optim on the Mac to compress images. Yeah, cool. Um, Cornel Lezinski, the creator of that tool, also created DSIM. So um, DSIM is very, very nice in the sense that it measures the dissimilarity, which I think is a k kind of more intuitive than measuring from, uh, from, a, from the minus realm in the, in the numbers. So the structural similarity index would give you something between minus one and one, which I think is weird. The similarity, the, the dissimilarity index X-ray express, expresses that in a positive number, which I think is more intuitive to the human eye. So if I wanted to measure differences in images to, my, to make sure that uh, the, image, the image is still acceptable. I could do this like this. So I've got DSIM compare. Again, it's a symlink. Don't expect DSIM compare uh, if you install DSIM. And we want to, let's say, compare the source JPEG to the mod JPEG version. And you get this integer. Um, and, you, and you can read it like percentages. So if this was a, was a one, this would mean 100% of difference. Then this is uh, two digit percentages, one digit percentages, after the comma, after the comma, after the comma. So this means Mods JPEG has created a visual difference of 0.038%, basically nothing. So Mods JPEG was super conservative in this, go, in this run. And we can use this number, the dissimilarity the, the index, to fine tune Mods JPEG to be more aggressive about compression. Um, the reason being, human eyes, again, faulty, are not as good as de detecting differences. So there must be a sweet spot how much difference the human visual system can accept before it detects these differences. And the truth is, there has been little study about this, but there, but there is one company who has run studies on this, and that is, uh, uh, oh god, um, Tammy Everts with, oh god, what's her name? What's the company's name again? The Redware, no, they, they no, the company they bought that doesn't exist anymore, something with S. Strange Loop, thank you. Strange Loop doesn't exist anymore. That's why I didn't remember the name. So Strange Loop ran these tests, and they found out uh, that the difference that a, hum that a human can accept for input and output image is about 1.5%. Good number, 1.5%. So we can fine tune for that. So let's we can create a tool that gives us the optimal image that has exactly 1.5% of difference because that is what the human eye won't see very very likely. So, um, and I, of course, I built this because, yeah, I was on the search for the perfect image optimization tool. So the tool is called CJPEG DSIM because compressed JPEG DSIM with a dissimilarity index. It's, uh, it's, a, it's basically a proof of concept, but it, well, it runs well enough. Um, and it's on GitHub. And it looks like this, CJPEG DSIM. 
and I'm telling it to use mods JPEG under the hood for the JPEG encoding, and I'm giving it the source JPEG as an input. And now you're going to notice it's going to run a while, a couple of seconds. The reason being, it doesn't just create one image, it creates about five or six images because it does a binary search. It starts with a JPEG quality of 80, calculates the dissimilarity index. If it finds out the dissimilarity index is too low, it increases compression to reduce file size and vice versa if the dissimilarity index is too high. So it gonna, it's going to take a while to process, but at the end, we're going to get an image that is really, really small. That's this one. And look at that, 43 kilobytes. That's pretty, pretty cool. I'm very, very proud of that tool. So uh, we have gone from 83 kilobytes to, oh, 81 actually on the command line. That's weird rounding. 81 kilobytes to the conservative 80 with mods JPEG without enhancements, and then down to 43. And now you might want to ask me, well, are you sure that we don't have compression artifacts by now? You know what? Let's take a look. So we've got the source. Looks like that. Oh, let's put them side by side. Maybe that's going to work a little better. And we're going to look at this version too. Okay, actual size. No, 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 go away. So, I mean, I know it's a it's a it's a projector and stuff, but hmm, anybody see any major errors in this image? On the right hand side, that's the one that's optimized. Any huge compression artifacts visible that's going to make you, ah, oh my god, you can't watch that image. No, nobody's screaming, no? Good, because we are at 1.5% of difference. So let's run that again. So, source gpip, and there we have it. 1.42% difference, visual difference, with a di measure, measured with a dissimilarity index. That's a pretty, pretty cool saving, con especially considering that WebP is actually bigger. I mean, of course, WebP also uh, has a bigger quality setting, so if, if we were more aggressive about the WebP compression, we would still get a smaller WebP. But at the end, with CJPEG DSIM, you get WebP file sizes while you get JPEG level support. And that's awesome. And this is all thanks to Mods JPEG, because Mods JPEG is that good under the hood. So my tool is just a wrapper around Mods JPEG. The, the main weight is of, of the task is basically carried by Mods JPEG. So that's really, really nice. Um, the thing is, on large images, you might see differences. So one of the reasons why nobody shouted is because there was lots of detail in that image and it was, you know, it has this depth effect and stuff like that. So there wasn't a huge contrast corner where you might go, oh my God, this is a compression artifact right there. But if we had an image with, with a large contrast corner, we might see these, these compression artifacts with CJPEG DSIM. So even after I created that, my task wasn't done. I was like, I'm still not happy with this. So I, I thought about how does JPEG work when it compresses images? And how JPEG works is it iterates over the image by eight by eight blocks. So it goes from top left to bottom right in eight by eight blocks and optimizes, uh, optimizes these blocks, processes these blocks. That's the way the engineers built it that way at that time back then. So I thought, well, maybe I can leverage that process. Why not, instead of having a global quality setting, iterate on the image and find out different quality settings for different parts of the image. And now we're back to the topic of quality. So again, um, we started off with a quality of 96 for the source image, for the input image, right? Then I used GIMP to uh, create the source image we're working on and I set that on 85. Then uh, I said, let's automate the uh, quality setting for mods JPEG so we find an ideal sweet spot with 1.5% of difference. That's the CJPEG version. And it's on f uh, 59, which is, might be surprising to lots of you because if you were using JPEG compression in the past, you might think 59 is far too low and would definitely create artifacts, but not with mods JPEG. Not if, uh, not if mods JPEG does its job well. So these are the quality settings we've been using so far, but they're all global. This is one quality asp uh, aspect for the entire image. What if we could adapt the quality per tile? Because why not? Why the hell not? Who says this isn't possible? So I dug, some, uh, I dug a little deeper and uh, 
created another tool that can do that. And that tool takes a lot of time, so I'm going to start it right now. <laughs> it's called Adapt. Um, it's also available on GitHub, and this is definitely just a proof of concept. Don't use this in production. Um, there are people interested in porting it to C. That's very, very nice. I'm currently thinking about porting it to Golang um, for funsies, basically to create and to up my Golang skills. If that's done someday, this might run better. Right now, don't use it in production, please. But I can show you, because of its proof of concept, that it works. Um, how does it do the things that it does? Because we need to find out which quality setting to use, right? So I thought, where do I get compression artifacts when I optimize an image? And I already gave it away. Um, I get compression artifacts at high contrast corners. So let's look at the source image again, and maybe we can detect areas where we might see where we might see compression artifacts. So there is, for example, high contrast corners here from a bright setting to a dark setting. Or this one, yeah, this one w will definitely create a compression artifact. This is because we have a, str a, st a very strong uh, switch from dark to bright. This is where the JPEG encoder would botch up. It would make a mess and create a compression artifact. And that's bad because the human eye detects these. So I needed to find out where high contrast corners were inside an image and exclude them from compression. I first started off with an all-directional Sobel edge detection algorithm to do that. It basically just creates white lines around the corners. For, and with that map, you can detect these corners, measure if there is a line inside an, a tile of a JPEG, and then exclude this. But after a while, I wasn't satisfied with that anymore because I figured, let's say I want to I wanna optimize a photo with a face in it like here, like lots of people with faces, I would get a corner here, I would get a corner here, I would get a corner here, I guess. You know, M Sobel would detect these corners, but Sobel wouldn't detect corners inside faces. So I would get compression artifacts inside the face, which is bad because uncanny valley effect again. I don't want that. I, w I want faces to look pristine. I want the main meaning of each image to be pristine under compression. And this is where Jet came in. Um, that guy. Um, so we thought about uh, how can we do this? And we came up with the idea of using a saliency mapper. A saliency mapper is an algorithm that detects important parts inside an image. Um, Hilary Mason already mentioned that in the keynote this morning, that image analysis is, the mo is a super important uh, topic this year, and it's absolutely true, because we need to uh, to, to, uh, to be able to deal with all that data and to make our tools smarter, we need to be able to tell computers what's inside an image. And that's what sa uh, saliency mappers have been created to do. So um, they started off as university projects in, I think, 2000, 2005 even. And um, then there were a lot of white papers on how to do this, and they got smarter and smarter. There was also, from government side, there was the need to process video da data in real time to identify objects inside CCTV. So that's why they got more funding and they got better. And by 2012, they got good enough, I think. That's at least my opinion. Um, and I looked for, I read lots of white papers, and I, uh, I tested lots of those. Uh, of, of those tools, and then I thought I'm gonna. I had one that is actually worth my while. It was created by a, a university in Switzerland, and it was under open source. And I contacted the people and got them to agree to a proper open source license for that thing. And it's called the Maximum Symmetric Surround Saliency Algorithm. I know a complicated term. That's this one, MSSS, also on, on GitHub, by the way. And MSSS highlights differences inside an image. And that's not good. Oh yeah, because I'm not on the desktop. Here we go. So I just ran the saliency mapper, and the saliency mapper outputted this. This is a black and white map of the input image. White areas mean area of interest, black areas mean area <laughs> nobody cares. Um, it does this by a uh, algorithm of luminance, chrominance, contrast, etc., etc., to highlight interesting areas. So it found out that these faces here are interesting, 
It found out that this bright light back there might be interesting. See the cones that I mentioned at the beginning are also highlighted. And now, because JPEG iterates by 8 by 8 blocks, I can go from top left to bottom right in 8 by 8 blocks and find out how many white pixels are in each 8 by 8 block. And this is what ADAPT right now running is currently doing. So it finds out all black, uninteresting, all black, uninteresting, all black, uninteresting. And then after it iterated a couple of rows, it'll hit here and it'll find out, oh, this is actually a lot of white pixels inside the back, inside this blocks. Uh, I think the threshold I put in is something like 55% of, of white pixels for each, um, for each of the tiles. And if it, if it hits that threshold, it says, wow, that must be an interesting tile. Let's be careful about compressing this. So all the, uh, all the tiles that are deemed uninteresting are uh, being exposed to a high compression ratio, I think 69 right now in, uh, in the ADAPT tool. And all the uh, interesting tiles are compressed with the quality setting that the JPEG had when it was entered into ADAPT. So it, it automatically finds that out and uses the source images JPEG quality for the interesting tiles. And that way we are able to get rid of compression artifacts. And the depth has finished. That's great, because I was running out of words. Ah, oh, let's do that on a terminal, because it's prettier. Mm -hmm. So, Adapt has finished. Let's see how well it did. Again, we have the 81 source, and we're going to compare it to Adapt Compress. That's this one, 65 kilobytes. 65 kilobytes, that's still very, very good savings. But here's the kicker. We have created an image that is very, very, very undistinguishable from the source image. Again, let's prove it by math. So, oh, let's actually use that because it was good. So, we have this for the CJPEG version, which was highly aggressive in compressing and might have created artifacts. And we have this for the ADAPT version. So from 1.4% difference to 0.7% of difference. Huge drop. So we actually increase the quality between input and output image again by half, if you want to. So there's half the difference between these two. That's pretty, pretty good. And we still have significant file size savings. So when to use which is a question I get asked a lot. And I strongly suggest ADAPT is very good for hero images, because this is the first thing that a user sees. And, they do, and especially if they have important details in them, you don't want compression artifacts. So this single hero image might very, be, very well be worth your time to, you, to run through ADAPT, although ADAPT takes ages to run. But all the other images might actually be worth CJPEG DSIM. So I've talked a lot about how to adapt JPEG quality for uh, the contents of an image now. Which, which parts of an image are interesting and how to adapt the JPEG quality to, to that. But there's also the possibility to adapt um, the JPEG level to the network performance. Because yeah, as I discussed uh, at the beginning of my talk, I'm on mobile right now, I'm going through roaming, so I'm not the primary customer here, which means I get bumped back to 2G a lot. So when I'm on 2G, I have lousy connection, but I still want to read news articles and stuff, and I don't want to want to wait for them to load for three minutes. With detecting the network performance for me, a website would be able to ship a low resolution image to me, which is still acceptable, and which renders fast. You can do this using the HTML5 navigation timing API to detect uh, the network performance of your current client and then ship highly compressed versions of an image to those customers which have poor network connection. Or you can use a platform like Akamai to do this. We have opt we optimized that too. So that, too, that technique is called AIC. You can Google for that and find out how to build that. So create different, re different quality versions of an image, find the network performance of your end user and ship different versions depending on how good or bad the network of your current client session is. It's a very smart technique. Okay, so now I talked about a lot about what JPEG is able to do, but there are still things that JPEG is not able to do, namely transparency. Big problem. Everybody wants to use transparency. Lots of e-commerce stores we've been working with, they use transparency in their images, especially with bottles and stuff. They want to put backgrounds behind those. So transparency is still a big issue. And there is a ugly workaround, which I still think is super cool, um, that can make JPEG do transparency. And that is uh, nested in an SVG container. 
Who has you heard of the clown car technique for responsive images? Two people. Oh, damn. Okay. Um, so the clown car technique was used to create responsive images before responsive images were native. Very, very cool. It was it was a SVG container with different JPEGs inside, and because you could do media query detection inside SVG, you could switch out which kind of image to show. N nice hack. Zorro SVG for alpha transparency works quite the same way. You put the JPEG completely unintuitively inside an SVG container. Then, with the Zorro SVG tool, you generate an alpha transparency mask and with an SVG filter, subtract that alpha transparency mask from the JPEG and get a full alpha transparency image because of the SVG filter. You have the benefit of a highly compressed JPEG, very, very neat, and you have full alpha transparency. Only problem you're going to be facing, aside from the fact that the SVG filter takes a couple of minutes, uh, sorry, minutes, a couple of milliseconds to render, um, is of course that you have to have SVG uh, support on the client device. So uh, Android 2 is out, for example, which might be a problem depending on your client base. So this is an ugly, ugly hack, but here's the good news. Um, in the future, everything's going to be better. Again, like Hillary said, the future is awesome. There is JPEG XT coming our way, and you might say, well, there was JPEG XR, who the, who the hell cares about JPEG XT? The thing is, JPEG XT is not created by Google or Microsoft or any other entity trying to push a new format out there. JPEG XT is created by the JPEG Working Group, the same guys who created JPEG in the first place. And the good thing about JPEG XT is it's going to be backwards compatible, which means every browser since 1995 will be able to render an image, which clearly WebP wasn't able to do. So that's, that's all good news. And JPEG XT uh, will be able to do it all. Again, it will have 8-bit support, 16-bit support, 24-bit support, full alpha transparency, etc., etc. The only thing that it will not do is animation. But everything else, JPEG XT will solve for us. And because it's backwards compatible, we won't have a problem with it, which is great. And this is also good news. It also outperforms all the other tools. Again, very, very, very good compression, being smart about how to optimize the image. So JPEG XT is coming our way, and that's really, really good. So I want to leave you with, uh, the, with takeaways what to do when you leave this room today. Number one is, because I've been talking about it all the time, use Mods JPEG, really. Don't use Adobe Photoshop, Safer Web, or GIMP, or any other compression tool. If you're working with JPEGs right now and put them on the web, put them through Mods JPEG, because it's the best encoder out there right now. And then if you still have the problem that your images might be too big, Think about salting your Mods JPEG with tools like CJPEG DSIM for dynamic quality adaption. Or if there are hero images and you must, for all uh, intents and purposes, avoid compression artifacts, run them through Adapt to adapt quality setting per tile size. And then, second one, keep it up to date with JPEG XT development. It's being developed right now and the discussion is still ongoing, but it's going to be out soon. I think two, 2016, end of 2016 is probably likely. And deploy it ASAP when it's out, because as I said, it's backwards compatible. It's going to be able to ship the traditional JPEG inside its new JPEG XT container. So all the browsers will be able to display that. And when you do JPEG, mods JPEG right now, you're going to enable all your users to download images faster. And in 2016, when a JPEG XT is going to come out, you're going to be able to compress them even more and have all the benefits I've been mentioning. So thank you. That's all. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, hit me up. Ah, I knew that one was coming. Cool. Any thoughts on the FLIF format? Yes, um, cool, don't use it. Um, <coughs> the reason being, every format that is not supported by all the browsers needs polyfills, and polyfills take too long to process. We've done some internal testing, and while JavaScript is, I think, at on a, a one hundredth of the performance of native C right now, it's still not fast enough. So um, the discussion is that maybe in four or five years, JavaScript would be able to be that fast that we would be able to polyfill stuff like image processing inside the browser. That would be really cool and also kind of scary. But right now, don't use it. Because if you use an image format like that on the web, you will just create a bad user experience for your users because they need to have JavaScript enabled, and it will cause the delay. So. <laughs> That's an academic discussion. Uh, 
So Fliff is really, really cool. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, the first question is what about what was about Fliff? What's about Fliff? And now the question is disregarding the real world. Um, <laughs> pardon. What about the abstract features of, of FLIF? And the truth is it's an amazing format. It's really, really good. I, I like it a lot. It does a, a lot of things right. Um, still, I think you always must, re must regard your use case. So if you're only interested in storing images on disk, for example, as small as possible with while keeping quality as good as possible, image formats like these are great. But if you want to ship them to users, no. Okay, so thanks, Tobias.